Thank you, Warren. Good, beautiful spring morning to everybody. We're in uh, Luke chapter 6. We're going to read and study the final verses of Luke's 6th chapter uh, this morning. The conclusion to uh, the Lord's so-called Sermon on the Plain. I won't take the time to try to review the entire sermon, but it's always a wise thing when you're studying the Bible verse by verse, like we do, uh, to at least understand the mind of the biblical uh, writer, in this case, Jesus, as he transitions from one topic to another. And we call that context, naturally. And sometimes it's more important than other times because often the writer uh, will decide to just shift uh, topics. Uh, that's not the case as we move from Luke 6, 42 to the remaining verses. Uh, though many have suggested it to be so, uh, as they puzzle over the Lord's train of thought here, he's been speaking generally about how we are to uh, uh, love uh, one another, uh, narrowing it down specifically to an exhortation against censorious judging of others and then illustrating it brilliantly and humorously with the illustration of the giant beam in one person's eye as he diligently tries to take care of the speck in his other brother's eye. Uh, he uh, should tend to his own issues first before presuming uh, to take on another's. But then the Lord moves on in verse 43, uh, connecting the two sections seamlessly with that little conjunction for. Uh, for there is no good tree which produces uh, bad fruit, and so on the, the rest of the, the passage. That little word has, has troubled some, uh, not easily solving for what it implies. It's the ancient uh, problem. What is the for there for? Uh, how does it connect the illustration of the log and the speck in one's eye with this new topic of trees and, and their fruit? Uh, but the connection is to be found in the broader application, moving on from uh, being loveless and judgmental to a consideration of one's overall conduct and faithfulness to God. To be judgmental and hypocritical is to reveal a, a very serious condition indicating an inner spiritual disease. For it is manifesting itself in the symbolic fruit that you're bearing. Now the Lord's words are bracing in their warning. Don't sit and listen to me and think that I'm only condemning the scribes and Pharisees. They're an easy target. No, there's some of you unknowingly feigning a kind of discipleship of me, but you are deluding everyone but uh, including yourselves. And so Jesus says, verse 43, there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush, and so we're to think here that that's good fruit. You may not like figs, uh, but figs were good. So that's the point Jesus is making. Uh, men don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been 
well built. Now, I'm not going to say much about this in the lesson, but I think probably uh, the Lord was alluding there to Psalm 118, the rock, the stone which the builders rejected became the very cornerstone. And Peter uh, in Acts chapter 4 uh, in his impromptu message there uh, quoted from that. You rejected uh, the Messiah. You rejected the, the stone, the cornerstone which God sent. So this man built his house and he laid a foundation on the rock. Verse 49, but the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation and the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. And so the sermon ends, Jesus' sermon uh, on the plain. There's a cultural phenomenon today for uh, couples who are going to have a baby. When Cindy and I had our first uh, child, uh, we had no idea whether it was going to be a boy or a girl. Uh, it, we were looking forward to finding out. Uh, so Cindy decorated the nursery uh, to accommodate either boy or girl. I'll spare you <laughs> the rainbows on the wall, etc. And when he was born, uh, after 18 years, I still remember the pain. Uh, but after 18 years or so of grueling labor, uh, the pain and anxiety uh, disappeared immediately as we uh, both marveled with great joy as they cleaned our newborn child and our eyes examined the heads, the head and, and, and the, the hands and, and the feet and the nose and, and the ears of uh, this little baby until uh, the doctor or the nurse, I can't remember which, said, it's a boy. <laughs> And we realized it's a boy. Uh, we have a boy. And we, we eventually named him George Stanton, a very regal name. Well, that's the, the rare experience today because we're much advanced technologically and uh, parents will almost always find out uh, through ultrasound or whatever the sex of their baby before it's, it's born. And then they plan the great reveal because they are the only ones with that knowledge, but they have parents and friends who they want to know, are you having a boy or a girl? And the great reveal uh, takes many forms. It may be the, the husband uh, teeing up a, a golf ball and he slams his driver against it and either blue dust or pink dust flies out and surprise, they're having a girl or uh, a, a big thing full of balloons they let loose and they're either pink or they're blue and you've probably experienced a variety of other reveals like that yourselves. I know there seems to be a swing back the other way today uh, with people waiting till the baby is born to, to know whether it's a, a boy or a girl. Uh, but the most important thing uh, is the reveal when we find out is it a boy or a girl. Well, in our passage this morning, Jesus speaks to an even greater reveal, uh, for he emphasizes a spiritual truth he repeated in his ministry many times over in differing images, but with the same solemn sincerity. You reveal who you are on the inside by what you produce visibly. Uh, that's what identifies you uh, for who you are. And you reveal how faithful you have been to God's word by how you respond when severe trials come. Uh, your conduct, uh, even your destiny, uh, reflects who you really are. But as he often did, the Lord used a figure to make his point. It was a horticultural image of a tree and its fruit. And the point he wished to make is that every tree is known by its uh, fruit. And naturally, the Lord was a great teacher. Naturally, he simplifies it for us. There are only good trees and bad trees, only good trees and bad trees. And both the good and the bad trees 
are identified by their fruit. Uh, the type of fruit each produces informs us of the genus, we might say, of uh, the tree. So you see his logic, you see the Lord's uh, logic here. Uh, but sometimes I think it's necessary uh, to repeat things for clarity. So I'm going to do that with you this morning. Uh, so, so moving on from his exhortation to not judge, but rather love, the Lord is challenging his hearers. Are you a good tree or a bad? Uh, each tree is known by its fruit, so your fruit will reveal it. And it's not too difficult to discern. In fact, it's rather easy. We know what good fruit is. We're all in agreement. It's figs and, and grapes. He might have added uh, apples and oranges and pears, whatever uh, your favorite fruit is. And we know what bad trees or, or, or bushes even are. They are twisted briar bushes laden with thorns. But what is this fruit that the figure uh, represents? Well, they're all the things that make you, you, and me, me. Uh, they are the portrait we present to all as we go about living our lives, uh, our attitudes, our speech, the things that we do and that we spend time on. They are uh, what we offer to the onlooking world as that which is important uh, to us. It's all inwardly focused, or is it all inwardly focused? Uh, or, or do you take time for the good of others, and, and above all, for the service of the Lord? Is it all for pleasure and the thriving after the world's goods? Or do you apportion time and energy for what is truly good and beautiful, what, what the New Testament would label as good works? It can be a very deceptive thing, this, this fruit talk, because uh, human beings uh, are sentient uh, beings. Uh, they're thinking uh, people who understand the importance of image and uh, therefore are often avid to adorn themselves so that they look like uh, good trees. Uh, a weed or a, a bramble bush can often grow up to look like something it's not. It may look beautiful when in reality it's really a bad tree. But their fruit, again, will tell them out. Their, their heart, see, will not finally allow their deceit. And here is the primary principle in verse 45. The imagery is so simple and clear because the truth behind it is agonizingly clear. It's what a person has in his inner nature that determines what fruit his life will yield. We all have uh, this human organ that God has placed behind our chest uh, called the heart. It's arguably the most important or organ a human possesses, for from it flows a person's life blood. And because of its importance, the heart has long stood figuratively for the very essence of a human being. In literature, in language, in the Bible, uh, the heart of man has always represented uh, a person in, in uh, uh, his very soul or as I just described it, his inner nature. It's the place where moral and spiritual battles are won or lost. The Lord likens the heart here to a treasury. Uh, that's, that's this word thesaurus. And, you know, a thesaurus is a book just filled with, with, with words. Uh, it might also be pictured as, uh, besides treasury, as a storehouse or a fountain. Uh, all three images convey sources that are capable of overflowing. So that's, I want you to understand the word. It, it, however you picture it, uh, they're capable of overflowing. Uh, picture a treasure chest uh, overflowing with booty, with coins and, and, and jewels. Or the storehouse overflowing 
with grain or a, a fountain uh, whose water overflows uh, the boundaries of the fountain. Uh, Jesus says it is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. And if what is in the heart is good, then good comes forth. And if what is in the heart is evil, then evil comes forth. Both, both. Uh, the overflow uh, will reveal what is in the treasury. But notice this very interesting and, and really frightening detail. The Lord introduces us to us here what comes out of our mouth. Uh, that is our speech. See it? His mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. Our very speech reveals what is in our heart. And I've, I'm sure each one of us, if we took the time, uh, we could think back in our lives to when our speech uh, revealed what was in our, our heart. I have a friend, he's in the same business as me. It's not the identical business, but it's, it's in the same industry. It's not Seth. Uh, my friend joined a new company a, a year or so ago. It's a premier company, a name company in, in Dallas, but it's different uh, from uh, what he's been used to because it has a, a broader roster of what we might call hearts. It's got a broader <laughs> roster of hearts than what he's been accustomed to, and it's been a shock to his, his system. He, he tells me he's having to avoid the shysters within uh, this new company, and I know what a shyster is, and so do you. Uh, but I've asked him what he means by that, and he's explained that he can hear them uh, in their speech around the office, uh, devising the various ruses and, and, and guile that they're planning in order to gain advantage in their business. I can hear them, he said this weekend. I can hear them. The tongue reveals what's in the heart. This was a, a theme the Lord often emphasized. Of course, his half-brother James, uh, it rubbed off on him. He devoted a good portion of his epistle in James chapter 3 to the dangers the tongue can produce. It's a fire, he wrote, that can set aflame the course of our life. He, he likened it, and this is so interesting to me that the, the Lord's half-brother wrote this epistle and he just frequently almost quotes Jesus, but J James likened it to a fountain that is apt to send out either fresh or bitter water. But the Lord, in another place, in Matthew chapter 12, uh, again tied what comes from one's tongue to the state of one's heart. The mouth speaks out of what fills the heart, he said in verse 34, Matthew 12. And then he repeats the principle. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, and there it is again, uh, the tongue tied to the heart. Every careless word, they will give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And that last thought, by your, by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you'll be condemned, is not that one's words make a person just, or that one's words necessarily uh, condemn him, but that they reveal the condition he is in that is the source of his words. It is the overflow of the heart, the fruit of the heart. Well, the solution, as we all know, is a new heart. Uh, David's plea from Psalm 5110 still rings true. Uh, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I, I remember the first time I, I ever really read that and, and felt like I understood it. And it was, it's, it's profound. 
David had sinned. It was a great sin. He'd been confronted with his sin. He wanted to repent. He was in the process, I, I would say, of repenting. And he wrote that psalm, Psalm 51. And then you come to verse 10, and David says, Create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. So this is poetic parallelism, which we get in the Psalms. Uh, the clean heart is the steadfast spirit uh, within. Give me that, Lord, David is saying, and I'll have a good heart. I'll have a good heart if you'll give it to me. And that points, the very fact that he asked God to give it to him, that points to human inability, something David had ashamedly come to understand. He had come to understand that his only redemption was to be found outside himself. Thus, even in his repentance, he, he pled total dependence upon God and his provision. In the parallel passage uh, to our own this morning in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. It simply cannot. It cannot. One may try, and people do, to plaster a veneer of respectability and goodness upon themselves for appearances, but the truth will eventually become known. It will spill out of the fountain of his heart and be revealed, for your conduct reflects who you truly are and whether your confession is real. Only the new birth which grants us eyes to see and, and ears to hear and understand the good news of justification by faith alone in the saving work of Christ alone will bring such a new and clean and good heart to us. And then what spills out will reveal it. So we come, uh, the house that stands and the, the house uh, that falls, I, I called it the, the foundation revealed. As his sermon draws to a close, the Lord uh, reinforces his point from a different angle, the angle of obedience over mere profession and using an easily understood but different illustration uh, to make it. Uh, the lesson is that if one is to be his disciple, he must not be only a hearer of Jesus' word, but also a doer of it. The, th the thought is crystallized in his opening question in verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? And the, the question reflects a, f a phenomenon that deeply concerned our Lord. The Gospels uh, described the sensation his arrival on the scene had, had generated. Multitudes of people, I don't think we can truly understand it ourselves, uh, but the multitudes of people coming from every direction uh, to see him and, and hear him and witness the, the miracles and the amazing teaching that he brought with them. Oh, he had disciples. Uh, there was no lack of people who professed to be his followers addressing him as rabbi and calling him Lord, Lord. Uh, the issue was that their devotion to him was, was shallow and mostly based on all the wrong things. And then comes the vivid picture he paints of two different men, each building his own uh, house, each in a different way. Uh, his point is obvious and, and fundamental. In fact, looking around this room, as I always do, I think all, you, know, you know this story, some of you better than, than I do, but it, it's a very fundamental point. It is as foolish to hear the words of Jesus, or we might even say the gospel, it is, it is as foolish to hear the gospel and fail to heed the message as it is to build one's house with little planning or preparation. Some of you have built houses, uh, I know, uh, and, and I can imagine all the planning and preparation uh, 
that went into it, and aren't you glad, aren't, aren't you glad you did? And sometimes you didn't plan well enough and you re regretted it later. But so he describes the, the two men, uh, the wise man and the foolish man, as each operating under two different premises. The first is a man with foresight who has obtained the conviction that the sun will not always shine. No, uh, it will not always shine. Everybody here knows that. The sun will not always shine. Well, this man had obtained uh, that uh, conviction, uh, but the warnings uh, Jesus has sounded will inevitably come true, and he must be prepared. And, and the Lord paints this portrait of diligence and, and hard labor. He dug deep and he went deep until he felt the firmness and the sturdiness of this underlying rock. And there he laid his foundation and he built his house. One day the rains came as he knew they would and the storms, the streams rose and the torrents smashed against his house. It was alarming still, but it could not shake the house because he had built it upon the rock. His house stood firm. And that man, Jesus says, is like a person who comes to him and hears his word and then acts on it. He hears the word of God and heeds it. But then there is the second man, the second uh, builder, uh, who like the first has heard Jesus' words, but he has not acted upon them. He operates under a different premise. Uh, the fair weather will continue on indefinitely. Uh, so why labor so diligently to erect the kind of foundation the Lord recommends when in the meantime, he can continue on his course of a worldly pleasure apart from any kind of sacrifice, apart from the sacrifice the first builder went through and took upon himself. That is in the face of Jesus' own word directed toward him. He did not heed him. He lives as if Christ's words are irrelevant to him. He, he builds, failing completely to obey the Lord's instructions. But his premise was wrong. Uh, sooner than he thought, uh, the torrent came and, and burst against his house and immediately it collapsed. And as the Lord predicts, the ruin of that house was great. Jesus' uh, warning to the multitudes gathered there to hear him was to not ignore his word and build their spiritual house without him as its foundation. Well, had we been there today, um, we would perhaps have looked out upon all those gathered there, the crowd, the multitude, and, and seen little to distinguish one from another. Uh, the crowd consisted of people uh, who by appearance all looked the same, uh, using Jesus' figure. They were rows of houses. In fact, we see these rows of houses that from the ground up, as, as, as one drove down the street, so to speak, they all uh, looked the same. They offered few visible uh, distinctions. Perhaps someone had a maple tree instead of an oak, uh, or they had their crepe myrtles on a different side uh, than the other. Uh, but uh, they were there, uh, call it what you will, uh, empty profession, uh, blind presumption, mindless aversion to, to truth, or the grossly inflated hubris of self-perception. Some had built their house with no foundation, others on the rock of Christ's word. It is when the storm that will surely come arrives that these two foundations are revealed for what they are. Now there's application for us here surely for the storms and trials and afflictions uh, we inevitably face. Uh, they're varied, 
Uh, they are random, seemingly, but they're always a test of our uh, faith. I see a lot of tests today. Uh, and only when they are passed are we typically able to say that you know, that test was God's gift uh, to me. And it was the strong foundation that he had given me of faith in him that saw me through. It's true that we reveal how faithful we've been to God's word by how we, we respond when severe trials come. But uh, this seems not uh, to be the storm of affliction uh, the Lord warns against. Uh, Jesus concluded, notice, the ruin of that house was great. That implies more than the storm of affliction. In the Old Testament, storms often picture the judgment God brings. In Ezekiel 13, for example, the Lord condemns the falsehoods and pretensions by which the prophets had misled God's uh, people. He compares these prophets, these false prophets, to a, a fragile uh, wall that they plastered over with, with whitewash and, 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 and bring it to the ground. And, and uh, he, says, I he says, I will tear down the wall you've plastered over and bring it to the ground. And when it falls, you'll be consumed in its midst. This is God's judgment. It's a major theme of God's word. It's God's axiom to men and women throughout the ages. The stakes are great. I'll give you a few examples as, as Israel was finally poised to go in and conquer the promised land, God charged uh, Joshua, be careful to do all the law so that you may truly have success wherever you go. And history revealed that when Israel did uh, obey God, they prevailed. But as the years uh, progressed, new generations arose who failed to heed his word and the ruin of their house was, was great. We read about it in the Old Testament. We read about it in the history books. When John the Baptist came to them, think back, uh, he preached repentance, uh, but not uh, the empty type that the people preferred. This was back in Luke chapter three. He demanded that they bear fruits in keeping with repentance because he said the ax is already laid at the root of the tree. So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Later in the third chapter, in verse 17 uh, of, of Luke, John spoke of the coming Christ whose winnowing fork is in his hand to thoroughly clear his threshing floor and together, and here it is, together the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's the good fruit and the bad fruit, the wheat and the chaff. And sure enough, when Christ eventually conducted his ministry, he warned against vines with branches that had no fruit. Only by abiding in him, he said, could the branches bear fruit. And, and those who would not abide in him, why, uh, they would be thrown away as a branch and, and, and dry up and they would gather them and cast them into the fire where they would be burned up. But now notice, in Jesus' illustration here, the same time of judgment that comes upon the foolish man will come for the wise man. Uh, the rain and the floods and the winds, and, and yet his house did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. And as Jesus draws his sermon to a close, he is emphasizing and, and warning against the great threat the coming storm will bring. He's painting a vivid and awful and foreboding picture intended to instill fear in his listeners. It's a tornado-like uh, storm uh, that is coming that flattens his house and, and sweeps it away. One of the commentators asked the obvious question, is Jesus trying to frighten people into the kingdom? Well, in one sense, of course, the answer must be yes. Uh, there, there are many impulses uh, that lead people to trust and obey Christ and enter into the kingdom of heaven. It may be a deep sense of guilt 
and the need for forgiveness or the warmth of feeling in the face of God's love. It overwhelms them. Or even a rational consideration of the, uh, the facts and merits of the message of the Bible. That happens. People of that bent uh, come to realize this is true. Uh, this was a Whitaker Chambers type thing. Uh, when he saw the ear of his, of his child, it was like, no. <laughs> there is a God. But some are rightly frightened as the Holy Spirit can, convicts of sin and, and warns of condemnation and hell. It's never been a popular thing to teach or speak of hell. For if hell exists and, and promises the kind of misery and punishment that the Bible describes, it will inevitably be, you know, socially an uncomfortable uh, topic, something that we just as soon skip over and go to the next uh, topic. It's no wonder the unbelieving world prefers uh, to make jokes about it, to turn it into a, a little comedy routine. But Jesus spoke of hell often, uh, more than any of the other figures in the scriptures, you know that. And now as he concludes his sermon, he forcefully voices the urgent uh, warning, uh, the fair weather will not last. It's not gonna last. One day the rain will fall, the floods will come, the winds will blow and slam against your house. And if you have not the foundation of Jesus Christ as your savior, your fall will be hellish. But for all those who have Christ as their foundation, they will stand in that day, stand and rejoice. It will be a day of magnificent glory filled with the wonder of unfiltered worship. Our worship is filtered. It's imperfect, but one day it will be unfiltered. It will be perfect like nothing we've ever experienced. And that will be the greatest uh, reveal. And may all of us here look forward to that day with unfettered confidence and faith because we built our house on the rock, which is Christ. Thank you, Lord. Well, let's close. Lord, thank you uh, that you have given us uh, that assurance. You've given us everything, everything that we have, our hearts uh, that have been changed and transformed. Uh, you've given us new hearts. You've given us faith to believe the gospel. Uh, you have directed toward us toward uh, Jesus Christ, your son whom you sent, and uh, you have uh, enabled us to uh, build the foundation of our spiritual house up upon him. And we pray, Lord, for those uh, perhaps who uh, are hearing this and do not uh, know that and are struggling uh, they don't know the Lord Jesus. Uh, they're wondering uh, what this foundation is. And they're starting to be concerned that uh, they do not have that foundation. Lord, that you will illumine them and uh, give them, as David requested, uh, a new heart. Uh, all for Jesus' sake. Amen.